Ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, with a lot of emotion that I welcome you to the 24th and final hour of this year's 24 Hours of Reality, 24 Reasons for Hope. And I'm going to get to the 24th Reason for Hope in just a moment. But thank you for participating and taking part in this and watching. Thanks to all of you who have signed up for a day of action. Thanks to all who have communicated with us uh, through social media and by other means. Uh, this is really an inspiring event for me. And I'm so glad that we have had the opportunity to focus on all of the reasons for hope. You know, earlier this year, there was a scientific announcement that one of the big ice sheets, the one in West Antarctica, was collapsing and that it was irreversible. And some people at that time said, oh my goodness, what do we do now? It's irreversible. Well, that's the wrong reaction because we have an opportunity to slow that down and we have an opportunity to prevent other ice sheets from getting into that condition. And the same formula applies to a lot of the other dangers associated with the climate crisis. Some damage has been done, some regrettably uh, will be irreversible, but we still have more than enough time, or I sh should perhaps say just enough time, to avoid the, the really cataclysmic damage that the scientists tell us would take place if we were not making such progress and if we did not make more progress and move forward with a solution to the climate crisis. We've seen all these reasons for hope today. They're all real. And I want to move now to the 24th reason for hope. The individual and local and regional and national actions to solve the climate crisis are important. The business communities role, the investment communities role, uh, all of the other things that are happening that are so encouraging, they're all important. But ultimately, nothing can take the place of a global agreement. And there are a lot of reasons for that. There is, uh, by nature, a global aspect to this problem. And so the solution has to be global. If the, if the sources of pollution just move across national boundary lines, then uh, that makes it harder. But if there is an agreement in the world community to approach this in the correct way, then we can solve it. Fortunately, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has made this issue a top priority for the entire world. And his leadership has been crucial and has come at a critical juncture as we work toward the treaty talks that will culminate in Paris in December of next year. So we're going to look at the road to Paris, but I want to say a word uh, before that to those who have seen some of the efforts in the past to get a global agreement end in disappointment. Does that mean we should simply be discouraged and not invest hope in what is a very different process this time? Absolutely not. One of the great American poets of the 20th century was a businessman who became a poet during his business career. His name was Wallace Stevens. And he wrote a line of poetry that has a lot of meaning for me. Somebody reminded me of it not too long ago. He wrote these words. After the last no comes a yes. And on that yes, the future world depends. Every major struggle for justice and social progress in the history of humankind has met with a lot of no's before the last no finally yielded to a yes. The struggles in the abolition movement, the struggles for civil rights, the struggles for women's suffrage, the struggles for uh, equality of women, the struggles against apartheid, in South Africa, the worldwide struggle to get some sense into the nuclear arms race when it seemed to be about to spiral out of control again, the struggle for fairness and justice and equality for the LGBT community. That struggle is making progress right now. And what 
a, a happy development that opinions have changed so dramatically and we see another frontier of freedom and social justice crossed. This struggle to recognize the reality of the climate crisis and to come together with meaningful solutions is the greatest social movement in the history of the world. The future of our civilization depends upon it. And it's very fortunate indeed that we have all of these reasons for hope that are legitimate and real and represent meaningful progress. But ultimately, we are going to have to have a global agreement uh, to solve a global crisis. When we put 98 million tons of global warming pollution into the atmosphere every single day, as if the atmosphere is an open sewer, that's wrong. And it has terrible consequences. And when it goes up into the atmosphere in one part of the world, it affects the entire world. So we do need a global agreement. Now here are a lot of things we have going for us. Both the United States and China, the two biggest global warming polluters, are now beginning to work together in a meaningful way to, to come up with a solution that they can both live with and then the rest of the world can live with. Here's an interesting fact that a lot of people overlook in this. The world trading system is set by the World Trade Organization, the WTO. Here's why I bring that up. Some people have argued that if the United States, for example, or any single country takes steps to reduce global warming pollution, that might somehow put them at a disadvantage with their trading partners. Not so, because under the rules of the World Trade Organization, a carbon tax or an indirect fee on carbon can be collected at the border from other countries that have not taken the same kinds of steps in their own country. So there is no competitive disadvantage whatsoever. Second implication is this. If the two largest economies in the world, the United States and China, reach an agreement and present it to the world, and they put these measures in place, and then any other country tries to trade with them, in short order, they're going to recognize that it just makes common sense for them to go ahead and reduce their carbon emissions with the same kind of measures so they'll be on an even footing. So once we get the ball rolling, and it is now moving, then we're going to see the momentum pick up. I'm very excited about that. I want to go straight to this 24th reason for hope. Our sec the UN Secretary General is convening this summit uh, next Tuesday. Uh, the countries of the world are coming there, 162 world leaders and even countries that don't have their top person there uh, are coming with significant announcements uh, and, and it's a very encouraging development. This summit is going to focus on eight action areas. And we've talked about energy, we've talked about cities, we've talked about agriculture, we've talked about forests, we've talked about the other pollutants that are put into the air and the water and the soil along with the global warming pollution. We've talked about the financing and how that can get done and the need for resilience to build in the ability to absorb some of the changes that cannot be stopped We've talked about sustainable transportation and electric vehicles and mass transit, electric buses, and all the rest. All of these issues are going to be the subject of this UN special session uh, next Tuesday. I want to take this opportunity to express my respect and thanks to Secretary General Ban Ki-moon because he has made inspiring statements and has really uh, provided leadership. He has also pointed out the solutions exist. We're already seeing dramatic changes. These are all positive signs. I'm excited about it. The race is on. And this report that just came out yesterday shows that all countries at every level of income, they all now have the opportunity to build lasting economic growth while they reduce the risk of climate change and reduce global warming pollution. 
We've seen cities do it. We've seen states do it. We've seen uh, some countries do it. So this is the curtain raiser, this 24 hours event for the Climate Week uh, here in New York City. And the Climate Group has long organized this. And I want to remind everyone that there is a very important march coming up this coming Sunday, which is billed as the largest climate march in history. A whole collection of environmental groups have joined together uh, to join forces. And I hope that anybody listening and watching today who cares about the climate crisis will take the opportunity, if they can, to come and join the numbers that will be here in New York City. It is an extremely important event. So where do we go from here? I mentioned at the beginning of this commentary that the process this time is different than before. Nations are going to make commitments, they're going to make pledges, and they're going to be judged by global public opinion. There are bilateral meetings and small group meetings to try to harmonize these commitments. But that's just this coming week. Next spring, uh, early spring, in March rather, then the formal commitments will be publicly put on the table by all these countries. And then the negotiating process will begin in earnest between March and all through the rest of 2015, heading to Paris in December uh, of 2015. I'm extremely optimistic. I think we are facing a very different situation. The climate-related extreme weather events have definitively answered the question in most people's minds that, yes, this is not only real, it's the most serious challenge we've ever faced, and we have to address it. And the stunning technological and economic developments in solar energy, wind energy, efficiency, energy storage, smart grids, electric vehicles, all of the other reasons for hope that we've discussed during these last 24 hours have definitively answered the question, can we solve it? Yes, we can. Yes, we will. We have the tools we need. Where there is a way, there's a will. The question now is, now that there uh, is a way, will there be a will? I think there is a will. We've seen the changes in public opinion. We've seen the leadership uh, offered in all these different communities, including the faith community in every denomination and in every religion. So all of these reasons for hope build powerful momentum toward the fulfillment of the promise of this 24th reason for hope, the climate summit and the global agreement next year, which will be the 24th reason for hope.